Today we want to give our undivided attention to the words recorded by Luke in the book of Acts, the fourth chapter, verses 8 through 12, which was our first lesson for today. I will just read to you the last verse once again. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. We pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us this time today to reflect upon the gospel message found in the words before us. We pray for your spirit that he might give to us undivided hearts to accept your truth, to make it a part of our lives, and to live it to the glory of your name. Let your name be glorified in our study today as we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. There is a true story about a church in the southern part of the United States that had been stressing to its membership week in and week out the importance of witnessing Christ to their neighbors. There was one particular young man in the congregation, a young man who actually had some learning disabilities, who when he heard this message really took it to heart. The only thing he struggled with, in particular, was how he was going to do this. Well, it so happened that on one particular Sunday, a visitor came in the church, a man who was very skeptical about the message of Jesus Christ. And this young man walked up to him, and he approached him, and he said to him, do you want to become a Christian? The man looked at him very cold and he said, no, I have no intention of becoming a Christian. The young man was quiet for a moment. Then he looked at the man and he said very bluntly, well then, you can go to hell. He walked away. He didn't mean to offend this man. He just was saying what he simply knew to be the truth. You don't believe in Jesus, and you will go to hell. The reality was is that this had a great impact upon this man, and eventually he became a Christian. If we refuse to believe in Jesus as our Savior, the reality is we will not be in heaven. We will be in hell. Would you be able to say that to someone? Do we understand and recognize the truth found in that statement? Our culture today is very antagonistic toward Christianity. Very antagonistic toward anyone who might suggest that there is only one way to get to heaven. Our culture today is very much like the culture that the early apostles found themselves ministering in. When we think about the Greek culture and the Roman culture, they had many gods, didn't they? Many gods who had specific purposes. None of them were sovereign. All of them were confined to their little part of the world, so to speak. The apostle Paul was very distressed as he walked into the city of Athens, seeing how many idols that the Greeks had. We're told in the 17th chapter that he said this to those who were meeting here in the Areopagus. He said, men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walk around and look carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. Now what you worship as something unknown, I am going to proclaim to you. And if we were to read on further in this discourse, the Apostle Paul now points out that there aren't many gods. He wants them to understand that there is only one God, and this God is going to judge the world by the Lord Jesus Christ, and when he comes... It isn't going to be a matter of how sincere you were about what you believed. It's going to be about what you believed in. And it is God who determines that truth, not the hearts of humanity. 
as Paul and Silas would tell that jailer in Philippi, in order to be saved, one must simply believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. As I said, our culture is not any different. There are many people in our culture today who consider themselves to be very religious people. And they would say to you that everyone has their own belief system. And as long as they're comfortable with that belief system, that's great. And that every belief system is of equal value. And in reality, they're all worshiping the same God, just in a different way. You know, there is an ounce of truth to what they say. All these other religions are the same. Because when you boil them down, it is no longer God who is the object of worship. Man is the object of worship. People are worshiping themselves, their own accomplishments. And all these religions, they are leading to the same place. It's just not the place they think. These people are on the wide road that leads to eternal destruction. As I mentioned at the beginning of our message, our our service today, (coughs) last Sunday, Jesus appeared to his disciples, and remember the first words out of his mouth, peace be with you. Jesus reminds us that because of what he has done for us, his suffering, his death, his resurrection, we have peace. We have peace with God. We have peace in all circumstances in our lives. And then he also said in that same context, he says, all right, now this message of peace, we got to get this out to the world. And I'm entrusting this message with you. You are to be my ambassadors. The power of that witness is not found in us. The power of that witness is found in the message that we share. And so today, in the words of our text, as we find the apostles Peter and John beginning that sharing process of the gospel message to the world, we see how they stay on task, they stay focused on the message, and remind those that they stand before who condemned Jesus, and remind us today that there is only one message that is going to offer salvation to people, and that is the message of Jesus Christ. Today we want to understand the importance then of this truth. Only the revelation of Jesus saves. Let's just spend a moment to bring ourselves up to speed in reference to the context of what we have before us here this morning. It wasn't too long after that Pentecost event that Peter and John one day were going to the temple at the hour of prayer. And as they were coming to the temple at the temple gate, there was a man there who was crippled. He had been crippled since he was born. And he had been there day in and day out begging people for money. And Peter and John were the recipients of his plea. And Peter says, we don't have any money to give to you, but what we do have to give to you, we will share with you. And at that, he took the man by the hand, and he said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And this man who had never walked in his entire life suddenly got up and was jumping around and leaping around for joy. So Peter and John continue to proceed into the temple and this man continues with them. Now you might consider the surprise that these other people in the temple experienced because this man had been at this temple gate day in and day out. In fact, probably some of those people that were in there that day had kind of walked to the other side of the gate to avoid him uh, because he was a constant nuisance in their minds, okay? So they were very familiar with him. And now, this man's jumping around. He's rejoicing. He's praising God. What could this possibly be? And what the Lord was doing was opening a door here for now Peter and John to explain to them who it was that gave them the power and ability to, to carry out this miracle. And so what do they do? They begin to explain to them that this miracle was done by the power of Jesus Christ. That's right, Jesus Christ. Remember the man who was hung on a cross outside of Jerusalem here not too long ago? Well, let me tell you something about this, Jesus. They said, he's not dead, he's alive. We've seen him. 
And now he has ascended to his throne on high, and he's with the Father, ruling all things in our best interest. Well, as they're taking this opportunity to preach, the priests and the temple guard and the Sadducees come walking along. The greatest nightmare for them. They thought they had done away with this Jesus. They thought they were beyond this. They killed him. They got rid of him. They thought that this would be enough for his followers to cease and desist. How would they possibly dare continue to spread such a message? But here Peter and John were. And they saw the look on the people's faces there in the temple that day, and they recognized the fact that this message was having an impact on these people. They didn't want any of this. So quickly they arrest him. They arrest both of them and put them in jail overnight. It was late in the day. There was no time for any kind of trial. So the following day, the Sanhedrin, the rulers, the elders, and the, the scribes, they all gathered together just as they had done with Jesus, and they told them to go get Peter and John and bring them before them. And here's the question that they put before Peter and John. By what power or what name did you do this? Now, what were they doing with this question? First of all, they knew the answer to this question, okay? But what they were hoping to do was intimidate these two men. They thought that by bringing them in here, bringing them before this august body, they were going to silence them and they'd quit doing this because maybe it would lead them to think about what had happened to this Jesus that they were so free to talk about. Well, our text is the answer to this question. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we are being questioned today for a, a kind act that has been done for the lame man as to how this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that it is by the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. By him this man stands before you healed. What we see here is something that Jesus had warned his disciples about before his suffering and death. Jesus said in Matthew's gospel, but when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. He had warned them. He said, hey, as you now will be going out into the world and sharing this message, understand this, that it's not going to be any better received than it was when I shared it. And you're going to be hauled in before authorities, and they're going to question you. They're going to threaten you. But he says, don't be worried. Don't be filled with fear. Because this spirit, this comforter that I promised to send you, which has already come now on Pentecost in this case, he says he's going to be right there with you, and he's going to give you the words to speak. And he's going to take away the fear and he's going to put the words in your mouth, and he's going to enable you to speak boldly in these adverse situations. And that's what happens here with Peter. Because we know what Peter is capable of in the past, right? We've talked about that. We've, we've talked about how Peter crumbled. He had that opportunity there in that outer courtyard to actually confess Christ before these people, and what did he do? He denied him. But he's not doing any denying here, is he? Because he's speaking by the power and confidence of the Holy Spirit. You want to know by what power or whose name we have done these things? Peter says. You'll notice that, first of all, they can't bring themselves to acknowledge that a miracle has taken place. You notice that? They just refer to it as this. They don't call it a miracle. They deny it, just as they uh, seem to have denied Lazarus being raised from the dead. And then when we think about the blindness of their unbelief, they cannot bring themselves to mentioning Jesus' name either. They know whose name they have been using. Peter says, is it right, is it proper that we're being called to account here for such an act of kindness? Is that proper? Peter is very clear about why they were able to do this. What does he say? We did it. By Jesus Christ, Jesus meaning Savior, Christ meaning the Anointed One, and he is the one who is from Nazareth. He's the one, remember? You rejected. You falsely accused him. You put him on trial. 
You had him crucified. Well, we want, to know, we want you to know something. You didn't get rid of him. He's very much alive. He said he would rise from the dead, and he did rise from the dead. He's that one whom God has promised long ago, the one whom you spiritual leaders should have recognized, the one you supposedly are looking for. They were Israel's spiritual leaders, and yet they rejected the one whom God had given to them in his grace and mercy. And it wasn't that they were just jeopardizing their own souls. They were jeopardizing the souls of all those that they were leading as God's servants. To make his point, Peter goes to the scriptures and he quotes from the psalm, Psalm 118. He says, this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you builders, which has become the cornerstone. These leaders, these spiritual leaders were to be building Christ's church. Now, in, in ancient building, the cornerstone was more than just a decorative stone. It was the keystone to the building. As that stone was put into place, the rest of the building got its direction from it. If that stone wasn't placed correctly, if they didn't continue to look back to that stone as they placed everything else in the foundation, then the building would not be sturdy. The building would not be a good building. So it was, Peter says, as we build the church, we don't use our own building materials. We don't put in place what we think is best. We turn back to the scriptures and we use Jesus Christ as our chief cornerstone. They had rejected that stone, the stone that God provided. They didn't have to go looking for it. God gave it to them. He says, here, put this stone in the corner. Build from this point forward. No, they rejected it. They said, we got a better stone. And what was the better stone? They were the better stone. They looked to themselves. They didn't look to God's chosen one for their salvation. And what had they done? They had excluded themselves from the building of God. They weren't those living stones, as Peter speaks of, that are put in place and are a part of God's building his church. Paul warned about this type of work in his first letter to the Corinthians. He said, by the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should be careful how he builds, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. The test will be on judgment day. And the fire will burn off all impurities and it will show the church's work for what it is. Those who have sought to seek to build the church based upon what the itching ears of people want to hear, placing the emphasis on humanity, leaving out God's grace, those ministries will be shown for what they are in the end. And in the end, that these people will not be saved. They're going to find themselves in a place that they did not expect. It is only those who have made Christ the center of their ministry, of their faith, that will find themselves with Christ for an eternity. Peter concludes with a verse that emphasizes just how important and precious Jesus is. He says, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. There are a couple of things that are found here in the original. First of all, salvation has the article in front of it, the. What is he emphasizing with this? He's telling us this is the salvation. In other words, it's the only salvation. It cannot be found anywhere else. And what does he mean with the term name? Certainly he's referring to Jesus, but he is also referring to that revelation of Jesus as it is found in the scriptures. That revelation that God's given to us so that we might know how to be saved. 
You can't find salvation anywhere else other than in the scriptures. That's where God reveals himself to us. That's where he has shown us his grace. That's where we find the Father loving the world instead of wiping out the world and promising to send a Savior. That's where we see where his chosen people, time and time again, were not faithful to him, but he did what? He remained faithful to that promise, didn't he? And then he sends his son, and he didn't spare his son, but he gave him up on the cross as an offering for all of our sins. And a Savior who not just dies, but he rises again and is living in eternity. That's found in the scriptures. That's where we find the truth that we've been delivered, delivered from sin and its condemnation and its control in our life, delivered from death, that we are not destined for eternal destruction, but eternal life. And Satan, he doesn't have control of us. Christ has control of us. We have been delivered from the danger of hell and brought into the safety of fellowship with Jesus now and for eternity. Paul writes this at the beginning of his letter to the Colossians. He said, He, Jesus, has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves and whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. How do we know this? Because he's alive again. He's risen from the dead. Notice Peter in our text uses the word must. In other words, it doesn't matter how sincere you are in what you believe. It's what you believe. And if you don't believe this, you don't have this in your future. I think in a lot of ways, the emptiness of the religions of this world are seen in the funerals that are are conducted in our day and age. One of our members attended a funeral for someone they knew and just said it was commented to me just how bankrupt that service was, so empty, devoid. It's a lot of talk about the deceased, how wonderful, how nice. And I mean, come on, if we think this guy is a good guy, was a good guy, God's got to think he was a good guy, right? God's not looking for good guys. He's looking for good perfect people. And there's only one way we can be perfect in Jesus Christ. Paul wrote this in his letter to the Romans. He said, Scripture says anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? Would you agree with me this morning that the gospel message is important? Would you agree with me that the message of Jesus shedding his blood at Calvary and rising again is a precious message? And by that I mean it's a message that alone can save and you can't substitute it with anything else. Would you also agree with me that this is too good of a thing for us to keep to ourselves? I think a lot of times we forget, especially someone who's like in my situation, where, I mean, just days after I was born, I was baptized. I don't know anything other than being in the Christian church. I, 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 can't, I don't remember a time when I didn't know Jesus being taught to me. Do you hear what I said? Being taught to me. In other words, somebody brought Jesus to me. Somebody brought Jesus to you. If someone had not shared Jesus with you, you wouldn't know him as your Savior. The Spirit would not have had that opportunity to work in your lives. Well, now it's our turn. It's our turn to share it with other people. The book of Acts is about how God took these imperfect people You know, these guys who deserted him on the night he was arrested, who were in that house, locked for fear of the Jews on the night that he first appears to them, he takes these fragile, imperfect individuals, and what does he do? He uses them by the power of his spirit to share the gospel with the world. The spirit empowered them in such a way that all of those apostles, except one, give their life for the sake of the gospel. It is by the power of that same spirit that you and I are to now be the ambassadors of this truth to other people. Throughout the book of Acts, we find what? Individuals, men, 
women living their faith in Jesus Christ and then doing what? As God opens the doors, as he opened the door here, right, to Peter and John to share Jesus with a group that we might say, why didn't they just be quiet, shut up, just get past this and then move on? No, they were witnesses to these people as well. It's not ours to determine who gets to hear this message and who doesn't. Jesus told us to go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation, right? And as at times that causes us to be afraid, or we might say, as so many have said, you know, I just don't have the ability to speak. Huh? Well, God solved that problem with Moses. He said, I'll give you the words to speak. And he solved that problem with these men. He gave them the word to speak, and he'll do the same for us. There's nothing to be afraid of. How can we not tell everybody that we know about this good news? If we don't, who's going to tell them? A man by the name of Dave Hastings tells the story about how when he was about 13 or 14 years old, he was sitting on the porch, front porch with his friend Mike. And his 13 and 14-year-olds would do their goofing around, and all of a sudden they got on the subject of death. And Dave jokingly said to his friend Mike, he said, Mike, what would you do if I died? Listen to what Dave said. I can remember it like yesterday, he said. It would break my heart because you died without Jesus. Because of his friend's witness in this way, this changed Dave's life, and he did become a Christian. Is there anyone in your life that you know this to be true? Someone that doesn't know Christ as their Savior? Let us be the ones who energetically and joyfully and gladly and willingly bring the message of Jesus Christ to others. Because you see, only the revelation of Jesus saves. Amen. Please rise. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please join with me in making confession of your Christian faith as we use the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and a life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Our service today continues with the gathering of our...